as long as it's not the Bible. But uh, the songs are not inspired, and uh, you can just mix them up and sing them any way you want to as long as it blesses God's people and brings glory to God. I don't know what else matters, to tell you the truth. All right, take your Bible and turn to the book of Acts, if you will, please. Acts chapter 12, that's where we're at tonight, Acts chapter 12, talk a little bit about the, the great escape, it's good to have you here tonight, we had a good service this morning, a good crowd, and anytime anybody gets saved, as far as I'm concerned, that's good, you know, and um, I just praise God that uh, the people are, you know, uh, <clears throat> I tell you what, I, I Personally, I think using this response card is the best thing I've seen in all of my ministry. And I mean that. You say, well, do you think everybody that prays that prayer is saved? Probably not. Probably not. Do you think when you everybody walks the aisle is saved? <laughs> Probably not. Probably not. But the point is, that's none of my business. That's not my business. My business is try to get people to pray and ask Jesus Christ to save them. And uh, I give everybody benefit of a doubt. I mean, that's all I did to get saved. And that's all you did to get saved, if you're saved, right? So, uh, so I don't know. I don't know. I don't worry about it. But if I can get somebody to trust Jesus Christ their Savior, I'm going to do it. And, uh, but I love, that, uh, I love that response card. And I think every pastor in the country ought to use it. I believe that because it's a wonderful tool for people to respond back to the pulpit. And um, I just think that, uh, you know, I, I am not opposed to the invitation. In fact, I just got through preaching last week, twice down in Arizona, California, gave an invitation after each service. Uh, we're going to have guest speakers in here. They give an invitation for people to come forward and walk the aisle. They're going to have my support. Uh, I may do it. When I want to, I will do it. But the mistake we make is that there's only one way to do it. That's the mistake. Do you realize that the invitation as we give it was never practiced until Charles and John Wesley? They didn't do it in the Bible. Charles Spurgeon never gave an invitation for people to be saved. He just preached the gospel from the pulpit, and usually at the end of the month or so, there'd be 500 people lined up to get baptized who'd, who'd accepted Christ as their Savior. So, you know, we've got to get over this idea that everything we do was done by the Apostle Paul, you know. It's just, you know, it doesn't mean it's wrong. It doesn't mean it's wrong to do it, but it doesn't mean that it's, that it's written in stone or that that's, uh, you know, that's the way it was in the Bible. That's just, it's, we're, you know, we, we, don't have the, we don't have the ability many times to sort out tradition from Scripture. We think we do. But you see, it was, it was tradition in Jesus' day that made the Word of God of none effect. And those people weren't stupid, and they had the Bible. But they had so mixed it with religious tradition that the Bible had no place. And, uh, you know, we just, we just can't believe that we could have any tradition hanging on us. And, uh, but what we need to do every once in a while is have somebody to challenge us from the Word of God and show in the Word of God where these things were practiced and where they're necessary. So uh, we just don't care as long as folks get saved. See? So if they pr come forward and weep at the altar, I'm not against that. Or if they bow their head in the, where they're at there in the chair and ask Jesus to save them, so be it. Right? How many of you got saved in your home? Anybody here get saved? Good night. Uh, how'd you get saved in your home? Explained it all to you and you got saved. Is that how you got saved? Somebody else here said they got saved in their home. Who was it? Well, I know how you got saved in your home. Okay. Go ahead and tell me about it. And they sat down and opened the Bible and told you how to be saved. Told you to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you'll ask him to save you, he will. That's what they told you, isn't it? And that's what you did, right? And you believe he saved you, right? Oh, well, that's good. That's good enough. Okay. Anybody else get saved in the home? Go ahead. When did, tell me about it. Uh huh. Yeah. 
Sure. And you got saved at home. And it's okay to walk the aisle. Not a thing in the world wrong with it. And I don't want to send the wrong message to you. That's not my point. I'm defending what I'm doing, <laughs> justifying the use of this card. That's all I'm doing. All right. Anybody else get saved in the home? Okay. Uh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, Linda, go ahead, Linda. Yeah, and you just read the invitation in the back and got saved, right? Sure, sure. You see, the thing about it is there's so many different ways, and the bottom line is always trusting Jesus Christ, you know. But how people get there is irrelevant. It doesn't matter. If they come forward and walk the aisle and get saved, wonderful. Or if somebody sits in the pew and bows their head and asks Jesus to save them, wonderful. Or if you're reading a book and there's an invitation in it, and you bow your head and get saved, good. If you're driving down the road and listening to a preacher preach, and you want to get saved, good. Just don't bow your head while you're driving. You know, you may go to heaven sooner than you planned. Take some folks with you. But, uh, you know, so, so you just, you know, there's, it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter as long as folks trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. So it doesn't mean any of those are wrong. But when you start thinking one way is right, then you think all the others are wrong, and then anybody that doesn't do it like you do it, it's out of the will of God. That's the major mistake with a lot of the things we do. And, uh, you know, we just kind of thank God for how He works in the lives of people and through churches, and, and praise the Lord for the number of people that got saved this morning and for those that said, I want to be a part of the uh, 101 through 401 class. And if you're here tonight, as Brother, Mer uh, Brother Havens already said, if you have not enrolled in one of those classes and, and done so, I'd encourage you to do it. If you're already a member of the church, I've told you from the beginning it isn't, it isn't required of you uh, by, by any stretch. But uh, I'd like to encourage you to do it so that you simply know what we're doing. And maybe God will use you one of these days to teach one of those classes. I'm hoping that we can get to where our layman can teach those classes. And, you know, but you have to go through them and, and uh, be familiar with the material to be able to do that. And so, uh, you know, maybe God will make that possible. Here in Acts chapter 12, the, uh, uh, <clears throat> the disciples are, of course, uh, Stephen has already been killed. And uh, now we see uh, actually Satan continues to fight against the cause of Christ. And... Uh, You'll notice, uh, how many of you did not get the notes? You didn't get the notes tonight. Hold your hand up. These men will make sure you get them. These notes right here, you didn't get them. Okay, I guess you got them. All right. You'll notice, uh, first of all, we're going to talk about the power of Satan. And uh, you'll notice the position of Herod. And, of course, this, is, uh, this, this Herod here is, uh, is Herod Agrippa. And uh, he is... Um, uh, uh, persecuting uh, the, um, the church in verse 1. And you'll notice that uh, he, uh, he uh, takes James. In verse 2, he kills James. And you'll see the death of James. And he is the brother of John. And it's uh, always Peter, James, and John who are working together. He's one of the original, uh, James is one of the original 12 apostles here. And uh, he is always associated with Peter and John. And when you read the Gospels, it, uh, it'll be Peter, James, and John, Peter, James, and John, Peter, James, and John. And uh, you remember when uh, Judas... Uh, betrayed the Lord and, uh, and hung himself, or hanged himself, however you say it there, he uh, was replaced by uh, an apostle, uh, to someone to replace him by a fellow called Matthias. Now, this is really important to understand this because uh, right after the Lord's ascension, going back to heaven, it was necessary that uh, someone be, be appointed to replace Judas. And that would maintain the 12 apostles. Now, the reason for this is found in Matthew. And I want you to keep your place in Acts here. But let's go back to the book of Matthew. And if you look at Matthew chapter 
uh, chapter 19 and also Luke chapter 22, you will see why it was necessary to replace Judas Iscariot. Now, you've got to get over this idea that Paul was God's choice to replace Matthias. That is not true, Math or to place, replace Judas. Matthias was the right choice. They had, prayed about, they had prayed about this choice, and they had the leadership of the Holy Ghost in their choice. And folks, the Apostle Paul wouldn't even qualify to be one of the twelve. For to qualify to be one of the twelve apostles, you, have, you had to be in the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ from the baptism of John all the way to his death. This was a requirement. And they make that very clear in the early part of the book of Acts when they are choosing one to replace Judas. So Paul couldn't even qualify to be one of the twelve. So Matthias was the right choice. but. Why was it so important that uh, the, the apostles appoint Matthias to play, take Judas's place? In fact, this was the first order of business after the ascension. After Jesus went back to heaven, the very first thing the apostles did, the first order of business, was to get an apostle to replace Judas. They felt the need to replace him. And why? Well, the answer, I believe, is found in uh, Matthew chapter 19 and uh, down about verse uh, oh, 28, 1928. And Jesus said to them, that's to the twelve, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me, that's the disciples, the twelve, in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit on the throne of His glory, the regeneration here is the millennial kingdom. It is the kingdom that's going to be set upon the earth, and that is called the new birth or the regeneration. He says, in that regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit on the throne of His glory, that hasn't happened yet, He says that He will sit on the throne of His glory, you, that's the twelve, you shall set up on twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now he tells his twelve that when he sets up his kingdom on earth, these twelve would sit on twelve thrones as judges, just like they had in the Old Testament, the judges. And so these twelve are going to be ruling right underneath the Lord Jesus Christ. But one of them committed suicide, if you remember, betrayed the Lord and killed himself. So they had to appoint another one to take his place, and that was Matthias. Now when you go to Luke chapter 22, let's go to Luke 22 as well, and uh, you see just another account of the same, uh, the same statement, and look down about verse 29. Luke twenty two twenty nine, He says, And I appoint unto you a kingdom, as my Father hath appointed to me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. Again, he's talking to the twelve. He's not talking to you or me. And he says, And set on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So it's very clear that when Jesus Christ sets up His kingdom on the earth, that these twelve apostles are going to be resurrected just as David and just as all Old Testament saints and New Testament saints as well. But these twelve are going to be resurrected and they are going to set on these twelve thrones. Now that was a done deal, that was a set, and no one else was going to take that place. So then, what you have then is when James, who's one of the twelve, is killed, nobody is appointed to replace him. There's no need to makes no difference. Matthias, or Judas, was a traitor and went to his own place, the Bible says, and he will not be resurrected to fill one of those positions. But James will. And there's no need, when he was killed, there was no need to have anybody to replace him. By the way, in fact, none of the apostles thereafter were ever replaced. Therefore, there's no such thing in the Bible as apostolic succession. 
The only one that was replaced was Judas. None of the others. And that ought to tip you off right there because here you have one that is killed, James, and nobody replaces him. And there's no record of any of them ever being replaced as apostles. And the reason is obvious, and I've told you the reason, is because the twelve had filled that position and they are going to be resurrected and they are going to sit on twelve thrones when the Lord sets up His kingdom and they're going to be judges on this earth in Israel at the right and the left hand of the Lord Jesus Christ. No doubt King David will be there, but this is going to be his immediate circle as he sets up his kingdom. And why not? <laughs> why not? And so uh, this is the reason is they're going to rule with him. Now when we move on down through, the path, uh, through this, uh, you notice when James is put to death, it pleases, that in verse 2, it said he killed James the brother of John with a sword, and because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. So you notice the writer uh, has already been to the end of the book of Acts in chapter 28, and he's reflecting as he's writing on these events back there. It's all history to him. Uh, he's already been through the book of Acts, and uh, now he's writing those things that take place. And uh, so Peter now is apprehended, and this is done again to please the Jews. It's a political move in verse 4. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison, delivering him to four quadrants of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. And so this was done to please the Jews, and as I said, it is therefore, it is strictly political move on Herod's part. And uh, the execution was scheduled to follow Easter. And let me, that word Easter is Easter. It's not a mistranslation. It should not be Passover. It is Easter. And these new Bibles that take the word Easter out and put Passover in, uh, they have no grounds for it. The word is Easter. And, uh, you know, Easter was a Roman holiday. And it was, it was observed in Babylon a thousand years before this event. So it didn't, Easter has nothing to do with the resurrection, but Easter fell occasionally fell on the same day of the Passover. So they happened sometimes at the same time. But it was a pagan holiday, and Herod observed it, and some of the Jews observed it, just as Christians observe it today. <laughs> I mean, you know Easter has nothing to do with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Nothing whatsoever. It has to do with rabbits and eggs. Easter has nothing to do with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not, oppo I'm not opposed to having egg hunts and having Easter plays and anything else to get a crowd in here to get, if they want to come and hear Jesus Christ, hear, hear about the Lord Jesus Christ. But, you know, we're just talking about tradition at the beginning of my message. And Easter is a pagan holiday, which has been incorporated in, and uh, just so is Christmas. Chris Mass. Chris Mass. You get it? <laughs> I'm sure you do. And uh, so, you know, these are just things that have nothing to do with biblical Christianity. None whatsoever. So Easter is the right word here, and it was a feast. Uh, uh, it was a feast. And it matched a feast of the Passover at that time, and it matched this pagan holiday every few years. So don't you worry about these fellows that try to tell you Easter shouldn't be in your Bible and all that kind of nonsense. It should be there and, uh, because it's a, correct, uh, it's a correct word that was there. And then Peter was kept in prison. But you'll notice it says prayer was made for him. And you'll notice the power of prayer uh, in these verses. And uh, the uh, prayer was made without ceasing of the church of God or unto God for him. And, uh, you know, we, it's hard to get people to pray till they get in trouble. <laughs> you know, you get cancer or you have, your family starts falling apart or your children run away from home or, you, you know, you start having a problem. And then, then folks will pray. It's too bad it's that way. It's too bad it's that way. It shouldn't be that way, but it just seems like that, that we don't pray when everything's going well. Uh, we just seem to forget God when everything goes well. And uh, so...
Here, Simon, P James has been killed, and Peter now. Uh, you know, these are the leaders of the church. And these folks are expecting Christ to come back and set up the kingdom as he had promised. He said in Matthew 17, there will be some standing here that will not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his glory. Uh, Peter had preached there in the uh, early part of Acts that if you'll repent and get baptized, he'll send the Lord back and the kingdom's going to be established. And so this is their expectation, and rightfully so. But things aren't working out. Stephen has been killed. Uh, James has been killed. Peter now is, uh, you know, is threatened with death. So the church goes to prayer. And uh, in verse 6, uh, you know, these, we see that there are guards posted outside, and, and, uh, and an angel comes in verse 7, comes in and uh, wakes up Simon Peter. In verse 6, it tells us that he's sleeping. That tells you a little bit about him having, uh, having perfect peace. <laughs> if you knew you were going to die in a couple of days, you wouldn't be sleeping, you know. But here he is. He is, uh, he is between, sleeping between these two soldiers. He's bound with two chains. And the keeper, uh, there's keepers before the door. There's uh, uh, guards uh, at the prison. And, uh, and an angel came in. And, uh, and the Bible says that a light shined in the prison. Maybe the light was from that angel. Because it's not uncommon when uh, the radiance of an angel lights up the area. When Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration, his appearance was brighter than the sun. When Paul was saved on the Damascus Road, he saw a brightness brighter than the sun. Um, and so this angel himself may have uh, just caught, filled, the, filled this prison with light. And he came in and he smote Peter on the side. He said, hey man, wake up. And he raised him up and said, Arise quickly, and his chains fell off from his hands. Now this is, uh, this is a special miracle taking place here. There have been millions who've been put in prisons, of good godly people, and they were not delivered, and they went to their certain death. So God doesn't do this for everybody. This is a special miracle for an obvious pur person, a purpose. And uh, he told him to get his shoes on in verse 8 and to cast his garment about him. And he said, follow me. And so this angel woke him up and freed him from his chains. And Peter was dressed and followed the, him outside of the gate. And they went outside the prison. Now Peter, uh, you know, he's, he thinks he's sleepwalking here. Uh, he feels like this is a vision. This can't be real. And uh, that's the way he thinks about it. In verse 9, And he went out and followed him, and knew not, wist not, or knew not, that it was true, which was done by the angel, but thought that he uh, saw a vision. Uh, this is what he thought was going on. And uh, they passed the first and second ward, and they came to an iron gate that leads to the city, which opened, of its, opened to them of its own accord. This is probably the first automatic door that just opened up. Maybe that's where the guys got the idea, you know. Can you imagine that? Here you are 2,000 years ago, and a guy walks up to an iron gate, and he just <coughs> swings open, you know. Well, you'd think that was a vision. You'd think that was a dream. I mean, you, how real could that be? Uh, here he is. His chains fell off. The room is full of light. The doors open up. And what about all these guards? Well, somebody put them to sleep. <laughs> Something's going on. And they're standing around. And uh, verse 10, it says, And when they passed the first and second ward, they came to an iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. And they went out, and they passed on through to one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. Some of you will remember Brother Ken Bates's message that he preached here called The Departing Angel. What a classic. And he preached on that departing angel. So Peter realized then that this was not a vision. You know, verse 11, it says, And he came to himself. That'd be a good sermon topic sometime. Yeah. You remember the prodigal son? He came to himself. And you cross-reference cross that. And he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord has sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all of the expectation of the people of the Jews. And so Peter realized that this was not a vision. And uh, so now he's outside the gate. 
and uh, he goes to, uh, to, to the house, and when he had, in verse 12, when he had considered this thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, and uh, they were gathered there together, and they were praying at Mary's house. And uh, so Peter uh, rings the doorbell, and you'll notice that uh, they were gathered. And look at verse 13. And Peter knocked at the door of the gate, and a damsel hearkened named Rhoda. And when she, had, uh, when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. So you see the power of God. You see that she is uh, uh, excited about Simon Peter, and uh, she just is beside herself, and she even forgets to open the door. Maybe she looks out the little peephole, and she sees Simon Peter out there, and she is just so excited, and she runs back out and says, He's out there. And they said, You're crazy. She's in jail. He's in jail. Notice what you said in verse 15. And they said to her, Thou art mad. Boy, if this isn't a commentary on human nature. Now what have they been doing at Mary's house? They've been having a prayer meeting. What have they been praying for? The deliverance of Simon Peter. And what did God do? He answered their prayer. And what did they do? <laughs> we don't believe it. <laughs> isn't that amazing? See? That's amazing, and that is just how true, I mean, that's the Word of God, how simple and how honest it is. If you were making this story up, you wouldn't have put it this way, you know. And, uh, and so uh, Peter continued, they said, it's his angel. It's really not him. We've been praying all night for him. It couldn't be him. And uh, they were astonished. And you know, that's why it's important when we pray. The Bible says that we're to pray watching thereunto. If you're praying about something, you ought to keep a list. You ought to keep a log if you're praying for people or praying for things so that you can, you can chart God's answers to your prayer. Because if you don't, you won't pay attention to them and you won't remember them. And, uh, you know, you, you, need to, you need to have those milestones and those victories in your life. And they help you. When I was a, a student in Bible college, I guess I've told this every story I know in my life I've told, and repeatedly, but they're, you know, they're getting fresh to me again. And, uh, but I remember we had, a, we had an old car, it was an old 55 Dodge in Bible college, and I was going over to, I was going over to uh, Des Moines, Iowa, and I was preaching over there that Sunday night, and I had a lot of tools laying around. I didn't. You know, and we're driving along with this 55 Dodge. It, it didn't have fuses, it had breakers. So when it would overload, it'd just throw the breaker. And I didn't know this, okay? Didn't know anything about cars, still don't. But I know when the lights are out. So we're driving along, the lights go out. Well, I got to pull over, you know, and side of the road and sit there. And I just sit in there and try to figure out. I have a clue what's going on. And I sat there about five minutes, the lights came back on. I should have prayed, and I thought it was a miracle. But I'm sitting here, and the lights come back on. And uh, so I take off. I go about a mile or two, bloop, they go out. So I'm sitting there. And uh, boy, this just goes on. I'm not making any headway. I just go a mile or two, and the lights go out again. And, uh, and here it is, about 10 or 11 at night on, uh, on a Sunday night. Got to get back to Omaha. Got to get up and uh, go to work, uh, go to school in the morning, 7 o'clock in the morning. Got to be in class. And I said, uh, I don't know what we're going to do. And my son Randy, he was about, I don't know, 13, 14, 15. I don't know what he was, 12. I have no idea. It's one of the kids. And uh, I, I said, I don't know what we're going to do. He said, well, Dad, why don't we pray? I said, this is serious, you know. We, I mean, you know, quit kidding around. He said, no, we've got to pray. Here I am studying for the ministry, and I don't know what we're going to do. And my son says, why don't we pray? I said, well, you've got to. I mean, you're stuck. When your little boy or girl says, Daddy, let's pray about it, you're going to pray about it. And all of a sudden, it's not acting anymore, you know? So, uh, so we prayed. And uh, I kind of looked around. I thought, oh, yeah. And would you believe it? A pickup pulled right up behind us. It happened. The guy had on, a, had on one of these shirts with an emblem at a gas station where he worked. He opened up the trunk, looked in, saw the problem, fixed it, said, see ya. 
down the road we went. Every time my son preaches, he tells that story because he's a, he's a, he, he tells it a little bit different than I do, you know, because he's the hero in the story. But, uh, you know, uh, we forget God's blessings and how easily we forget. We forget. And that's why God had to remind Israel over and over and over and over what he's done for them. And so you need to, you know, you need to take, uh, keep a journal or, or take, remember good things God's done for you. It'd be a blessing to you because you will forget them. You'll forget them. Uh, I want you to know, uh, notice also uh, when you move on down, uh, verse 16, Peter continued to knock and when they had opened the door and uh, they were what? <laughs> they were astonished. They were astonished. You know, uh, I feel like I'm in good company with that crowd, don't you? I don't feel superior to them, not a little bit, you know, because we're surprised when God really does something. We're, we're surprised, you see. And uh, that which ought to be, uh, you know, normal, uh, we, we, you know, it, we're surprised. At. Well, <clears throat> of course, uh, this created some problems here because in verse 18, now, as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers of what was come of Peter. Now, the, the scene moves back to the jail. It's morning now, and these soldiers now, they're waking up, and they're stretching, and then these guys got these chains, and their, their prisoner's gone. Now, think about it. The ward, he goes through two wards, so you know those doors are shut. You got the, they got the guards at the gate. You got the guards with the chain, but no prisoner on them. That's going to be hard to explain. Try that, telling that to the chief. First of all, they don't know what's happened. So you know some foul play. As maybe somebody took a bribe or something. Because uh, Herod was not pleased in verse 19. And when Herod had sought for him and found him not, he examined the keepers and commanded that they should be put to death. Because he's not going to buy this story that an angel came in the prison and took Simon and took him out. In fact, they couldn't explain it anyway because I guarantee you they were, they were probably, uh, probably snoozing there. And uh, so Peter uh, left from Judea and went to Caesarea and he abode there. Peter got out of town got out of town. But God's not through here because you can see His wrath. The power of God's wrath is in verse 20 through 23. And you have Herod's death. You have the death of Herod. And uh, he is smitten by God. And he's eaten by worms. I mean, here he is sitting in his royal garb on the throne. And uh, you know, uh, the people that hear him say that you know, they listen to him in verse 21. They said he made a an oration unto them, and the people gave a loud a shout and said, It's the voice of a God and not a man. <laughs> and he accepted it. And uh, so God said, Well, I'll show you he's a man in verse 23. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not God the glory, and he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. <laughs> so they had quite a feast, you see. And the thing about Herod here is he is, a type, uh, he is a type of the Antichrist, but he's also a type of Israel because Israel is not giving glory to God either. And what we see is the gospel moving away from Israel and the Holy Spirit is moving away from Jerusalem. And that's why if folks don't understand the nature of the book of Acts, you'll never get it. The book of Acts is a transition book and it starts out in the first half of the book offering the kingdom to Israel again and the nation of Israel rejects it and so God is moving away from Jerusalem little by little. There's no repentance taking place in that city and, uh, and, or in the nation uh, uh, enough to even get God to look at it. And uh, so uh, God is, uh, he, uh, as he smites this king, he's a type of the Antichrist and also a type of Israel that is going to be consumed and was destroyed. Now, you see the power of God's hand here in the ministry. When we move on down to verse 24, it says, But the word of God grew and multiplied. Now, isn't that something? 
It's the power of God. And even though the devil tries to stop it, he cannot. The Word of God is not bound. You take a man and throw him in prison, what does he do? He writes uh, Pilgrim's Progress. You throw a man in prison, what does he do? He sings praises unto God at midnight and the jailer gets saved. Uh, you can't bind the Word of God. Now God may take you and put you in a situation you don't want to be in. He may put you in an environment you don't want to be in. But you and I need to accept God's will. And whatever situation we're in, we ought to use it for the glory of God because God has a purpose. So if it's a hospital bed, try to bring glory to God while you're in it. If you're banished from your home or your country, try to bring glory to God while you're there in your banishment. If you're put in prison, and I hope you're not, but if you're put in prison, try to bring glory to God while you're there. The Word of God is not bound. And so uh, uh, it, began, it continued to multiply because God has a plan. You know, here's the thing about it. When the Antichrist comes on the scene, it doesn't stop the preaching of the gospel. Multitudes get saved in the tribulation. In fact, God has an angel that flies through the heaven and preaches the everlasting gospel. The Word of God is not bound. And God's plan is always right on target. God's plan is going to be carried out. And there's more people yet that's going to be saved, perhaps, than have already been saved. It's a, it, there's a number that no man can number that is going to be saved. Millions are going to be saved in the tribulation period. And thank God for them. And so uh, the Word of God is not bound. Now, here in verse 25, it says, uh, and you see these helpers here, um, that uh, um, Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem. And uh, when they had uh, fulfilled their ministry, uh, they took to them John, whose surname was Mark. Now this is the Mark who wrote the book of Mark. And uh, of course he, wrote, he is raised in a godly home. And uh, he later, uh, you know, he, he's a cousin of, uh, of Barnabas in Colossians 4.10. As I said, he later, um, uh, there was contention later on between Paul and Barnabas over this young man. They took him on a missionary journey and, and Barnabas came home early for whatever reason. But he wrote the book of Mark and eventually he won the Apostle Paul's approval, which we'll talk about when we get further over into the book. But um, Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem, and they're going up to Antioch. And uh, I just want to point out, if you have that, that, uh, that map, I just want to point out the location here. Uh, Brother Brandon gave me a pointer here. I'll try to point it out to you if I can. But over here, down here, right where the... Uh, uh, where the um, uh, pointer is. Here is Jerusalem, right over here on the right lower corner. And up here is Antioch. And everything is moving from Jerusalem, and Antioch becomes the center. This is where the believers that were persecuted went. And next week, Lord willing, we'll see that, the, that Barnabas goes over here to Tarsus, and he will get Paul, or Saul, and he'll bring him back and they'll come back to Antioch and they'll stay there two full years teaching uh, these new believers about the grace of God and I'm sure that Paul indoctrinates them during that period of time from his, uh, from his writings and pointing out the mystery of the church and all of that, uh, all of that mystery, uh, all of that ministry. And so uh, in this chapter then as we, we have uh, James is put to death Peter has been arrested. There's a marvelous a miracle how God uh, helps him escape from prison. And, uh, of course, Herod is killed. And then you're introduced at the end of the chapter to Barnabas and Paul as a team. And then when you get to chapter 13, you're going to see that that verse is a transition verse to take you to chapter 13. And then the great missionary work of the Apostle Paul uh, begins in that chapter as it leaves Antioch. 
And uh, you'll be looking at that next, uh, next Sunday night, and you'll see that first missionary, um, uh, first missionary uh, endeavor as they are sent out from that church at Antioch to take the gospel to the other part of the world. All right? All right, let's bow in a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you for your love and your mercy to us, and thank you, Lord, for the word of God. And I pray you'll bless these folks tonight. And uh, thank you that the gospel came to us, and we, uh, were, we heard how to be saved. For it's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. All right. Be sure and shake hands with some folks, and uh, may God bless you.